Well, today we're speaking to some leaders from across South African society, uh, business leaders, leaders of civil society, organizations, NGOs and the like. And we're speaking about the socio-economic future of South Africa as part of an initiative called CEFSA being hosted at Gibbs. I'm joined uh, by Lawson Naidu from CASAC. Uh, Lawson, of course, you work on issues pertaining to the Constitution. Uh, what is the state of constitutionality in South Africa? Do we have a problem around the Constitution? What's the work of, the, of CASAC at the moment? Well, CASAC's work is aimed at uh, strengthening the constitutional foundations in South Africa. And we work on that on a consistent basis, focusing on issues of accountability, the strength of our institutions of governance, uh, in particular, the you know, judiciary, parliament, the chapter nine institutions, issues around the separation of powers, and how public power is exercised within a, co a constitutional democracy. And I think in that context, if we look at it like that, I think we, there are some pressures on the constitution at the moment. Uh, we have uh, a number of institutions of governance that are not fulfilling the mandate that the constitution envisages for them. And these are key institutions in the criminal justice sector, in the human rights field, and I think that should be cause for concern for South Africans. And I think conversations like these where we come together from different sectors to address those challenges are very important. You know, some critics of, of these kinds of dialogues or settings where societal leaders come together and talk, critics will say, well, it's another talk shop. It doesn't lead to any real change. Uh, what is your sense of it and how does dialogue contribute to the constitutional framework in the country? Well, I think the fact that we bring together people from different walks of life, that people who are in different uh, spheres, whether it be religious bodies, the business community, civil society, uh, trade unions, we come together, we have these discussions, and we, it doesn't end that when we walk out of this room. We take part of that back into our daily work, and that's how it uh, becomes uh, active. Uh, how we we operationalize what we talk about so it's you know i think it's uh, it's a, mi a misnomer to call it merely a talk shop sometimes these things can be talk shops but i think the kinds of people that that are in the room give content to it of course we're at gibbs today and gibbs uh, main focus is business and the development of business institutions uh, often for profit and and for societal good what do you see as the role of business in South Africa, given the constitutional framework that puts an emphasis on social justice and transformation? What's the heart of business's role of that? Well, I think business can't operate in a vacuum. It's got to operate within a broader societal context to understand the challenges that the country faces, uh, the levels of inequality in our society, what role business has to play in terms of addressing those levels of inequality, how does business play a role in promoting human rights for ordinary South Africans. So I think business can't simply look at it from the point of view of its balance sheet and, and whether it's making money or not, but w what does it do for the health of our democracy? Lawson, thank you for your insights and thank you for being with us. Bishop Paul Varane, thank you for speaking with us today. We know you as a, a legendary voice for social justice in South Africa. For the viewers that don't know you, in a minute or less, tell us a little bit about what you do, not in your role as a clergyman, but in the broader societal context where you work. Well, one of the things that's occupying me at the moment is um, setting up structures to do, conduct hearings all over the country. So we have chapters now established in every province and in some provinces more than one hearing set up and those hearings go right into the communities and listen to communities for their issues ranging from land ownership to human rights issues to gender inequality to trauma that goes right back into the 80s and 60s and 70s of our history. You're participating today in a process that we've called CEFSA that looks at the long-term future of the country. What do you see as the role of faith communities and faith leaders in particular, uh, not just now in South Africa given some of the current challenges, but into the future? Our faith communities are profoundly placed because they have access to the whole range of South Africa every week and besides the work that has got to be done in their normal business of worship and the rest of it if you think of any for instance community gathering on a worship day there are connections in those communities that have far far reaching possibilities in terms of influence, in terms of intellectual capacity, in terms of the real potential of this country. 
And so I think if the, if the faith communities could begin to mobilize, uh, the contribution that they could make to the country would be, let me put it this way, historical. <laughs> Uh, of course, our primary audience as Gibbs is business people, business leaders, business managers, many of whom in a country like South Africa have a faith frame of reference of some sort uh, from where they draw their ethics and their morals and their worldview. What would be your message to a business audience that maybe at times struggles to bring these two worlds together? Well, you know, they say to speak of business and ethics is an oxymoron. Um, but I, I find a fascinating uh, phenomenon emerging in South Africa for, for pragmatic reasons. Business is learning that morality is a key component of profit. If you strip honesty and accountability and the rest of what really I suppose is the work of the faith community from business. You run the risk ultimately of bankrupting yourself and bankrupting the country more, more seriously. And so what's starting to emerge, and it's in our constitution, our constitution makes space for businesses to make effective connections into community, particularly communities that are marginalized and poverty stricken. For instance, the mining industry have got their SLPs. Other big business have got their community service initiatives. Now, you can just imagine, if what Mr. Mandela dreamt of, that poverty would be history in this country, in the 2020s. We have an instrument in place. The churches and business can put the will in place to deliver a transformed community. The fact that we're not is beyond reprehensible. Bishop, thank you for your what are always challenging inputs. Annabel Bishop, thank you for being with us today. Uh, when we started SEFSA, this uh, public conversation about the future of the country, we were concerned at the time, this is 18 months ago, about the possibility of things like state capture, uh, ratings downgrades, uh, cabinet reshuffles. Over a year and a half, we've seen all of that happen. And uh, you know, you're, as, as an economist, looking at this movie play itself out, what is happening in the economy and why? Well, what we've really seen, you know, essentially since the uh, past several years, since 2009, is a steady downward trend in economic growth in South Africa. And we've seen a lift in unemployment. And obviously that's negative for a country that's trying to reduce unemployment because that ov obviously spells the, uh, a rise in poverty and inequality as well. So these are some of the negative trends we have seen in South Africa. And the great concern for me certainly is it means people's lives are getting worse, not better. And here you're looking at the socio-economic implications and what's happening to the poorest in South Africa. So certainly looking forwards and you know obviously the credit rating downgrades is just a consequence of some of the actions that have been taken. We would certainly need to improve matters going forwards but what we have seen is a huge run up in borrowings since 2009 and that's obviously precipitated the credit rating downgrades and of course our very weak economic growth climate as well. It's too weak to actually um, allow us to continue at such high debt levels in an environment where we don't see an improvement in our state-owned entities as well, and that actually risks us getting further credit rating downgrades as well. So unfortunately, things have steadily been getting a bit worse. So we've seen a number of evolutions in policy over the last few years. We went through the uh, sort of RDP, gear, us GISA processes, brought us all the way to the NDP, but still we seem to be stuck. From an economic perspective, if the powers that be, whether the public sector and the private sector, if they got stuck in and made some adjustments to rectify this economic story and produce the jobs, what are those key changes that are needed? Well, you know, certainly we could look back to the success achieved under the Tabo and Becky years, where we saw economic growth lift to 3 to 4 percent and then rise up towards 5 percent plus in the latter years. And certainly that was a very strong economic growth period for South Africa. You know, what we have seen since about 2009 is that business confidence is depressed in South Africa. So 59 percent of businesses on average are dissatisfied with business conditions. That doesn't mean you're going to get strong investment, quite the opposite. And in fact, fixed investment actually declined last year. Instead, if you want to get strong economic growth going forwards, if you 
you want to create a positive cycle of job creation, upliftment and improvement in incomes, then you certainly need substantial fixed investment and you also obviously need an improvement in trade. And I think you know what we'd really like to see in South Africa is a better environment for doing business in the country, one which actually engenders business confidence, certainly with policy stability and policies that are supportive of businesses, ones which don't undermine property rights but which instead stimulate the expectation of future economic growth. Because if you believe the economy is going to be growing much faster, there's going to be a lot more demand for your goods and services, you'd obviously employ more people and look to invest more. So that's a positive virtuous cycle that we really need in, in South Africa and the same with economic trade as well. You know, certainly in that Tabo and Becky period I mentioned, we had an upliftment in economic growth globally, but so too now we are expecting to see economic growth quicken and improve looking forwards. And if we don't take advantage of that, if we don't have the conditions in place, and that doesn't just include the infrastructure with electricity, but many other factors as well, then we won't be able to see the benefits that improved trade brings. And if you look at the global authorities such as the IMF, the World Bank, they really cite openness and improvement in trade as being the key feature which lifts economies out of poverty into success. You're participating today in a conversation with a group of people that are not your usual uh, companions in business, where you find your natural home, uh, but are you know religious leaders, NGO leaders, civil society leaders. What is the the purpose of those kinds of engagements? Why would someone like you, an economist, engage in those conversations? Well, I, I do feel very comfortable with this environment as a social scientist, and that's what economics does. It falls into the social science discipline. So looking at socio-economic social science, certainly what we need is a broad consensus and an impetus to move forward in South Africa. So we can become quite stuck on the negative issues, but we also need a broad consensus of what's happening in all different areas of society to build social cohesion, actually lift us towards a more positive outcome in future. And I think the more groundswell we get from that and the more objective but positive and sustainable it is, the better we can actually bring about change for the majority of South Africans. As we were talking about earlier, a very high unemployment rate in South Africa, close to 50% for youth. This is not sustainable for people who are suffering this. We need to actually do a lot better. Annabel, mm -hmm. thank you for making an input. Gwen and Gwenya, welcome to Gibbs. Uh, you're the COO of the Institute for Race Relations, which of course does a wide ranging amount of research on the country, where the country is at, some of the factors affecting us. Give us a synopsis of where you think South Africa is at. What are the main headlines of where the country is at? Well, essentially, I mean, um, the, the key focus right now is obviously an economic growth. And I think if we if we don't address that challenge and how we are going to address the challenges and obstacles for achieving a more inclusive growth that really brings prosperity to a wider number of South Africans, we are going to see that filter into political issues, um, so into the political environment, and then also in terms of social stability. So correcting the economy is a key focus to ensuring political stability um, and overall societal cohesion so I think that forms a central part of the of the agenda but obviously um, secondly what I think sometimes what could be overlooked is education and really everything in our view flows from that because if you view education as sort of your human capital pipeline so you're talking about your future labor force your future um, members of hopefully a productive economy um, to the level to which they are have skills or have capacity to contribute to that economy is going to be critical and South Africa's human capital pipeline is looking really dire at the moment. So it's both an economic challenge and an education one specifically. The institute that you are part of the leadership of uh, obviously operates in society as a reflection of what's going on in society by doing research and other things. What do you think is the role of uh, research institutes like yours in taking South Africa for, from where it is to where it needs to go in the future? Well, I mean, of course, what would we provide society is sort of our public benefit contribution mm -hmm. is to provide the facts that underlie activism. So many civil society organizations, the media, et cetera, receive research from the institutes. And I think that's a role that think tanks or research institutions like ours can play, is that you need to have you know, substance behind the, the activism. So it's very well and good for other organizations to tackle their particular area, whether it be housing or education. So we're not necessarily at the forefront of every single policy space, but definitely a variety of organizations can then rely on the raw data that we can provide to formulate their arguments. So we, you know, policy has to be knowledge driven and knowledge led, and we hope that we can fulfill that role. I've heard a, a, a description of a weakness from your side of what some of these societal dialogues, like the one you're participating in today, yes. um, Sefso, what, what some of the weaknesses are is that they often don't lead to concrete change. 
in your view, what would be the way in which to conduct so those dialogues uh, that would lead to most, some of those concrete changes? What would have to be a different approach from business, from civil society, from government perhaps? What would you see that as being? Well, I, I don't necessarily think it has to be anything dramatic. So, ch you know, concrete action doesn't necessarily have to amount to, you know, something, you know, great or revolutionary it could just be to to not leave a dialogue without having actually put down to paper or made an agreement about actual tangibles and deliverables that will resu result from that engagement so i think planning is absolutely critical you cannot you know decide what to engage in if you don't plan for it so the planning process is of course critical but i think if you leave any any dialogue without having come to an agreement and a way to measure that particular action and um, a way to value at the end whether it's been successful it, 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 it becomes problematic otherwise you just have talk shop after talk shop but hopefully um, you know we, we're not one that will result in that way and I think I did mention in the beginning um, at least you personally is that I did come in as a skeptic but I think even if you are skeptical the best way is to still is to still participate and perhaps um, you know feed in your your concerns into into the process and I hope I can add that at least. As a final question, of course, in the last few years, South Africa developed the National Development Plan and it had support from the highest uh, office in the land, uh, very broad political support from Labour and other, other parts of society. Of course, not everyone, but the NDP did enjoy broad support. Yet we seem to be stuck in terms of implementation. If you had an audience with a cross-section of leaders across the country, with an NB, the NDP on the table or something similar, what do you think we need to do to get ourselves unstuck as a country? Well, that's a very very broad question, but I think also one of the challenges has been a plethora of policies. So I think people have gotten confused as to which policy is actually being pursued. So you mentioned the NDP, which is meant to be an overarching uh, policy framework, but of course then there's been your industrial policy action plan, there's been um, you know the seven point or nine point uh, growth plan, and recently now there's talk of radical economic transformation. So there's always a queries as to, you know, where is one a subsidiary of another or where does this new term and phrase fit in into, into the overall dialogue. So I think, uh, you know, synthesizing and aggregating policy is definitely a key governmental challenge um, to be far more succinct and focused in terms of, of, of policy implementation. Um, and to, you know, I think where there is great societal buy-in, for example, the NDP, then that needs to be pursued with a lot more focus as opposed to adding on additional policies to an existing framework. Gwen and Gwenya, thank you for those insights. Reverend mossen it's good to have you at Gibbs. Uh, you've been intimately involved in the setting up of SACLI, the South African Christian Leaders Initiative, that's uh, of course given birth to this uh, dialogue called SEFSA on the socio-economic future of the country. And this comes a against the backdrop of a long history in South Africa of churchmen and women engaging the public discourse. We had the likes of the Kairos document. Uh, we had other activities by the likes of uh, Bishop Tutu and others who helped the country through some of the change that it needed to go through. What do you think is the role of faith leaders now in South Africa? I think as always, faith leaders, um, their role is to trade in three things. Uh, the, at the end of the day, when all is said and done, faith leaders must help um, society to have hope in the future, to have faith that actions that are necessary to do today are done, and that there's solidarity uh, between different peoples, uh, or you can put it in social cohesion terms, um, and that. I think from where faith stands, and which is the reason that Satli uh, is involved in, in, in something like SEFSA, is that we have a country in which uh, so often society is tribalized into different interest groups where business speaks only to business and labor speaks only to, to labor, and uh, the two consider it's each other as class enemies, or at least labor does. Uh, and then uh, young people also uh, look uh, at life from their own point of view in, in terms of uh, faith, like must fall, for example, as, as a particular manifestation. And all of the, the different contributions by different people seem to be that we're talking past each other and we're not listening to each other. And as a result, instead of building something constructive together, we are running the risk of imploding. 
and having no future to work towards, no, uh, no confidence uh, either for business or for labor or for anyone. Um, and so all of that says that as, as people, who, people of faith, we, we are a very interested party in, in saying how do we build the, the emotional or spiritual capital for all of these things to, to come together. Of course, the, the majority of South Africans, uh, when we talk from the perspective of faith communities, uh, used to find themselves as opponents to the state during a large period of our history where they were struggling against some of the injustices. We find ourselves now in a new reality where uh, many of those faith communities have linkages to people in positions of power, people in positions in business. What do you see as the new role of the churches broadly, and not just the church, maybe mosques and synagogues, in bringing about the kind of future that South Africa wants to have? One of the things that have come up in, the, in recent research, I think by even Conrad and now, or I think Human Science Research Council came up with the same finding, is that the majority of South Africans have a lot of confidence in the church, or put, put more broadly, the, the faith institutions. Now, what that says is that we, we have a lot of responsibility to steward that trust in ways that help the country move forward. We happen to be in a context now where the biggest elephant in the room is one of state capture. Uh, in other words, an entire state has been stolen uh, and is no longer answerable to ordinary South Africans. It's answerable to others outside of our borders and so on. And so that is a moral cri crisis equal to none in the last 23 years. And I think faith communities have a moral duty to call that out and say we are in this crisis and to mobilize all effort to end the state of state capture so that we can begin to build a future that all of us can be proud of. A final question, Reverend. Of course, one of the roles of the faith communities has always been to speak truth to power. Uh, if you would uh, reflect on what you think the message today is, if when faith communities speak truth to power, what is it that they're saying? I think the big um, challenge that, uh, that we, we have now is, is one of corruption. And I think that the, there's a sense in which that ought to be spoken. And I think we, we've, we've, we've found that uh, that probably is not an exaggeration to say that's been done. I think th those in power know that they are in the dock, uh, stand accused by not only faith communities, but also South Africans are saying there's something smelling uh, in, in terms of those in high places. Uh, what is necessary is how to speak truth to power to the people on the ground. Uh, I think they, they are the ones who need truth told about what it means going forward. Um, in other words, an empowering of the peop ordinary people, whether it's women who are catching the, the wrong end of the stick or are being violated, young people who are denied education, uh, how do you empower them so that they feel they have a stake in what it is we're building? Uh, and so I think the truth to power in some way can be a misnomer to say that we depend for our future on those in power. Uh, the story of South Africa is one that says, actually, it's not the powerful who make history, it is the ordinary people. Uh, once empowered, they can shape history. And so we need to tell truth to, to, to ordinary people, whether these are uh, even in business or labor or, or civil society. What truth should be the galvanizing truth that enables us to move con constructively forward? Reverend Mosentla, thank you for being with us. Uh, whenever we discuss South Africa, what always emerges as a key theme is that however we create the future, it will be creating it together as South Africans from all walks of life, of course, business has a large role to play in constructing the future that we desire. <laughs>